I, I know that you guys read some uh, texts and you probably know a lot about what I'm going to talk about. But um, I'm coming in not from the academic point of view, but from a practitioner of the of the religion and somebody who uh, uh, represents it for a, a huge majority of it. So let me start my talk by saying that I didn't realize I was such a good Christian who's constantly in prayer. Uh, it seems uh, um, that's what it means. And it can explain a little bit about the misunderstanding between the Christian and the Muslim way of uh, seeing the scarf. Um, the second thing is, I want you to imagine Cindy Crawford 10 years ago. Her beautiful you know, hair in a red dress, short red dress on a Jaguar. And that's an ad um, to sell the car with her long legs, seductively leaning. Now, take her out and put me there, as I look right now. Exactly. <laughs> um, the whole point is that the difference is that suddenly the sexuality issue comes right at it. How do you use women? Uh, women have been used to sell things. Uh, their sexuality has been uh, put in the public sphere um, to attract uh, male uh, gaze but also the male financial pocket because you know Cindy Crawford is not going to marry you watching her on TV she's going to get you to think if I get that car hmm you know and actually it's true if you get that car perhaps <laughs> <laughs> um, so today in the faith and gender and the headscarf issue sexuality is uh, at the center of the debate um, uh, whether women are subjugated for exposing it too much or covering it up. And of course, I am the cover-up uh, part. Um, globalization, and I'm sure you've done this throughout the semester, is seen as a one-way um, invasion of Western values across the world. This is, may not be the place um, where this would be a dominant point of view. I, the reason you guys are here is that you believe that there are different ways globalization can be utilized to help the world. But if you come from my part of the world, you see it as McDonald in Mecca. Uh, you see it as um, somebody telling you how you should behave, how you should be. Um, and if you're not, then you are less than uh, what your potential is. Um, that the way you are is not acceptable. And that's something we don't even tell kids. We, we prevent parents from doing this to their children, of saying that the way you are is something wrong. And yet, there's this whole movement of doing that to a huge group of people. Um, there's a problem with globalization, or the way people understand it. And through classes like this one, it's supposed to help leaders, emerging leaders like yourself, change the way that global, globalization is used. But globalization also has a great advantage, especially when it comes to gender, is that it suddenly opened up a lot of role models or different um, ideas of what is to be a woman, and people suddenly have at their disposal, um, you know, um, role models that they didn't have before. They can see Sandra O'Connor uh, as a judge, well, although she has stepped down, and I, Soti Moyer, Soti Moyer is the new one, Soti Mayor, um, or they can see, um, you know, uh, Oprah Winfrey, or they can see somebody else who has done something great in their community that was showcased. So suddenly, it opened up a lot of great. Um, role models for many people that didn't have them. But the problem is that the respect kind of flowed one way. We respected those role models, but the respect didn't flow the other way around. People didn't respect our role models or the way that we saw ourselves or the way that we thought our duties were important or our priorities were important. Um, so the headscarf is one of those global issues that has you know, risen out of those kind of uh, considerations, is that just because I wear a headscarf, does that mean I'm retarded? Does that mean I am somebody who's brainwashed? Because to a lot of people, including Sarkozy, that's what it means. Um, if I wear a headscarf, if I choose to do something that um, the West does not approve of, then I am prevented from going to school. I am prevented from uh, applying for public sector jobs, which is where the majority of women uh, go to. And this is in the cradle of civilization. This is in the cradle of liberty. 
this is uh, in, in France, and that's what makes it more problematic. Because if it happens in France, then it can happen anywhere else in the world, in the free world. Um, so this is one part of my talk about what does the headscarf mean and um, this idea of globalization flowing in both ways. Uh, the other uh, part of it is that I'm here to represent a certain point of view, a particular point of view um, that you may not agree with that might contradict the way that you see the world. So for example, my reference is the Quran. It's not somebody else. It's not what society as a whole thinks is great. It's what the Quran says. And the reason my reference is the Quran that I believe it came from God, that God is omniscient, that he knows everything, that he created a system. It might, it might look very chaotic, but male and female relationship is just the same as the moon and the sun. It is part of the natural order. And therefore, when he um, tells us there are certain things we should observe, there's a reason for it. And if you go outside of it, there are huge consequences. It doesn't mean you're not going to go outside of it. It just means that beware. Once you go out of that system, um, a lot of uh, defects start to happen in, in the way that you're going to live your life. That everything is well planned. So I think that um, to a lot of people who rely on human beings for their own decisions, this becomes problematic. So I can't say the Quran is my reference point, but I can say that the Constitution is. So the Constitution becomes my Quran in, in the US. It's OK to say that. But if I say it's the Quran only um, as a religious authority, then that somehow makes me backwards, makes me um, uh, um, subjugated to, um, uh, to a hierarchical system that um, takes away my rights. Um, and when it comes to male and female relationship, because this is what, what gender is about, it's about the other, male, female, the Islam has a very particular point of view about why these two uh, genders or these two sexes were created. It is to preserve a family. Family is the most important point in the religion. It's not the male or the female. So it's not about losing rights in, uh, for a female or gaining rights for a male. It's about how does the family stay intact? How do you actually protect uh, the children? So physically, women are weak. We can say there are some exceptions, but most women are weaker than men, the way they were built. We have um, different physical things that happen to us that don't happen to men. And we go through nine months of pregnancy that actually pulls nutrients out of our bodies. It's a moment of weakness for us. And to pretend that this does not exist, that um, women are supposed to uh, function exactly the same as men and or despite of that is um, a point that we have a problem with in Islam. So when a woman is at her weakest, which is when she's pregnant or she has very young children, in Islam, it's supposed to be about the society and the men um, supporting her so that she does not have to um, take on more duties or work outside of the house if she chooses to. Um, and the penalty is, um, you know, part of it is that men unfortunately get attracted to women um, through their. Uh, visual um, appearances. And wearing the scarf is part of actually containing this. It may not seem fair. It may not seem illogical. But we think that women should be treated outside of the private sphere where she can be as sexual as she wants to be in her family versus outside where she needs to be treated as um, uh, uh, um, to be tweaked in that area. And part of it is wearing the scarf. Uh, again, as I said, this is a very particular point of view that you may not agree with. Um, but part of the globalization is that instead of saying, well, this is uh, the wrong point of view, it's sort of saying, well, you know what? If it works for that culture, and if this is what they like, then it's fine. With, we're fine with it. Versus if you do it, then I'm going to take rights of education, rights of health care, rights of work away from you because you chose that. And this is what is actually happening right now. And there are two things about the hijab that is very problematic. Is that most people confuse what hijab is. So they think niqab, which is covering the face, is hijab. No. Hijab is exactly what I'm wearing, something that is um, 
covering the hair um, loosely or the hair can show a little bit, it doesn't have to show, whatever. But this is what hijab is. Niqab is covering the face. Niqab is not in Islam. It's a cultural thing. The, a significant minority in Saudi Arabia, where I come from, Egypt, Pakistan, actually wear it and they choose to wear it. Uh, my problem with that is if they say that Islam tells us to do that, because Islam doesn't. And a lot of them don't even understand their own religion, unfortunately. But so their understanding of it as being mandatory is problematic for me because it is explicitly not mandatory in Islam. The other part is that as much as personally I dislike it, I don't want somebody to tell me whether I can cover or not cover my face. I don't want somebody to tell me whether I can wear you know, a Halloween costume or not wear a Halloween costume. Um, uh, you know, so I understand the security issue that France might have, but I think that it is not really a security issue that they were talking about. It was really a very, um, it's a form of discrimination against Muslims. They don't want to see France's identity changing and wearing the scarf, wearing the niqab, is kind of like a symbol of France changing. Um, and that is very uncomfortable. Europe is gonna go through a very uncomfortable time in the next 50 years as more immigrants uh, practice their own um, religion or way of life or look different. Uh, because it's a question of identity. How do you negotiate? What does it mean to be French if half the people who are French no longer look French, who might have another passport, another language, another religion? So this, these are all difficult questions. Um, right now, France is dealing with it by saying, we're just going to pretend everything is hidden. And it won't work for long. Um, yeah, so uh, again, we go back to the hijab. And as I said, the particular point of view is that you're not supposed to send sexual messages to the wrong party. You're not su you're supposed to be something that is very private between you and your husband. This is why it is allowed when you're getting engaged and when you're, um, when you're married and within your family to look as beautiful as you want to be. You can wear that red dress. You may not look like Cindy Crawford, but you can wear it. Um, whereas outside of the, uh, the family, then no. You're, it's not about um, a sexual role that you play. It is about a human role that you play. And that does not need the short uh, red um, uh, dress. Um, what has happened is that people take Saudi Arabia as the example for uh, the hijab issue, where it is mandatory, not that you wear the hijab, only if you're uh, uh, Saudi, but that you wear a black abaya. Have you seen those? And so this is kind of like a traditional thing that we do. And people take that to mean Islam. No, it's quite traditional. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, it is only particular to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is only one out of 100 countries that have huge Muslim numbers in it. People don't look at the others uh, to say the same thing. Uh, now, I'm actually one of those people who like the abaya because I was telling uh, uh, Dr. Wolf earlier on, um, if you have to run out of the house in five minutes wearing your sweatpants, it's so easy to just like button that abaya, it looks really gorgeous, and go to a meeting and nobody knows what you're wearing. Them. So for me, as a mother, it has saved me numerous times. Um, and, but again, I think it's a, a cultural thing where we actually um, uh, like it. Uh, my issue is that whether you have a choice of wearing it or not, and I'm one of those people who believes that you should have a choice. Um, Kuwait is a great example of a country uh, that is very close to us that actually does this. You can wear the abaya if you want to, you can wear the hijab which is like this, or you can not wear it. It's up to you. It's up to what you decide with your family or with your own tribe or whatever it is, uh, because it does uh, designate sometimes certain uh, uh, status, uh, what you want to be. And one of the, um, the cutest stories that I've ever had is that in Kuwait, um, I approached somebody and I spoke Arabic to them because I needed information, I was lost. And the person who was wearing the full abaya with the black um, hijab looked exactly like me, doesn't speak in Arabic. Uh, she was from Pakistan, she spoke English and Urdu, and, um, but she has decided to actually wear that this way, although she's living in Kuwait. So I, I like that. I like this idea of having the choice to choose how you want to do it. Um, and that's where globalization comes in. As people get access to different role models, they'll start, start to rebel against having one way of uh, dictating what you need to look like and actually start choosing it. So hopefully globalization will help us um, in that. Um, 
so as I said, this is supposed to be more of a conversation. I presented my point of view, and you guys have your own readings, and you can actually ask me questions if you would like. If you don't, uh, that's fine too. <laughs> 